So um, this is uh, essentially about, by the way, before I do anything else, I just uh, came from San Francisco yesterday night. So I'm heavily jet lagged and I'm kind of sick. So apologies in advance. So uh, the first thing that I basically need to tell if you work at a large company, you have a number about this, is that this talk is about, uh, not about Google, it's until then I have to say this. And afterwards, um, I'm going to be talking about a couple of things to you. Some of them, uh, some of this is actually about how to uh, work as a you know, designer and an engineer at the same time. And some of them is actually about more practical aspects of uh, how to uh, deal with the issues that comes with it. So the first thing is, I'm going to tell you about uh, where is this the best time for designer to learn about, uh, have to be a credo. And uh, the second thing is, you know, if this is more practical, to be able to uh, make a decision on which technology to learn about. And after that, I'll mostly give you know, some sort of an impression about how to um, do, what to do with the skills that you have achieved. And that's actually the most important part. So um, the reason that I can actually talk about this is that um, this is something that I do personally, and this is one of my main personal projects. I don't want to get into what this actually is, but um, uh, essentially the important part is I have been working on this for one and a half years, and uh, I was the only person, the designer and the engineer, working on this project. So. Uh, Essentially, what I'm saying, but really, what I will be talking about in this is quite possible. That's the idea behind it. So, um, <clears throat> in giving this talk, and I'm not a great speaker, but I really do have a passion about uh, this issue, and that is uh, I want designers to be entrepreneurs. And I know I have met some of you today, and um, most of you guys are actually working in large companies, in banks, you know, in large agencies. And this is kind of a different way to think about how to be a designer, because this involves going alone, trying to build your own company, maybe even selling products. And uh, I have found that it is actually an incredibly satisfying experience to be able to do that. And uh, the first thing I want to talk about uh, is uh, why would be, why would this be the best time to actually learn about coding? And this actually lies in the history of Silicon Valley. If you look at tech, this is pretty much uh, what I would get. It starts in the, in the, at the end of the 19th century, and it continues today. But if you actually went to look at how this whole thing works, you can actually split into four different ages. And these ages, each of them has a beginning, has an end. They are pretty gradual in that they move uh, into each other pretty seamlessly. But the first thing, the beginning of it uh, is called is what I call is the big iron. And uh, at the beginning of this, this is 19th century, you would have machines, computers, that would be uh, made out of physical uh, geos, and uh, that would essentially create uh, some sort of mechanical computers. And the good thing and the bad thing about these things was that um, they would do only one single thing. It wouldn't actually be able to become an actual computer. This was the machine that you see on the screen. This is actually the machine that they used in the 19th century for uh, census of the United States. So they used these machines to count the number of people living in the United States. And the machine did pretty much nothing else. After that, um, there was uh, the microprocessor. And what this was that, um, this actually uh, was the first real computer in the way that we understand. And uh, this was innovated, created by a company called uh, Fairchild Microprocessor. And uh, this company is the company today we know as Intel. So huge, hugely successful hardware engineers. And uh, at this age, the people who actually made the money were the people who actually got these little chips and they built uh, functioning computers out of it. So the computers like Amiga, Commodore 64, all of them were built uh, by using these little chips that people would actually have available at that time. And after that, uh, this is the more recent era. We have the uh, Mac, Windows, Linux, the operating systems and the personal computers. And uh, the good thing about this is that um, this is the moment 
that um, we had the hardware material. So if you're a software engineer, you could actually you know, just make software, and you would be guaranteed to have an audience, because everybody had their machines at home, and everybody had a, had a PC. It ran Windows 95, and that PC was able to uh, basically run whatever application that you would be building. So this is the age that um, you would get the Windows, the Linux, and uh, things like word processors, you know, Apple, Pages, uh, Microsoft, uh, Word, and stuff like that. So this was the age that you would get all of these useful things. And uh, the next stage is kind of an extension of this. And I would like to call it uh, the tech's experience. So the difference between this age and the last is that um, in this age, we actually had the maturity of not only the hardware, but also the software. So we actually have mature software, mature hardware, but that also means that uh, the, difference of, the difference between a good product and a failed product is no longer in engineering. Software engineering reached a point in time that um, a good product would essentially be doing the same thing as a bad product. If you have Microsoft Word, it would actually do the exact same thing, exact same thing as Apple Pages. So there was no difference in function. The only difference is the user experience. So the good thing about this is that uh, none of the people who actually make the money in this age today are not really engineers. They, they also make money, but it's mostly that it's basically us, the people who design user experiences. And uh, that's a huge thing, because for the first time, user experience is a competitive edge. That means um, if you're actually a good, good designer, an OK engineer, you, you don't have to be a great engineer, but if you're an OK engineer, you can actually have a great product that you just created yourself and selling. So uh, this is how, this is why I want, um, I want designers to learn about coding, because it actually allows you to do so many things that you would not be able to do otherwise. And uh, this is the more practical part about, of the talk. And uh, this is where I talk about how to pick uh, a technology, a coding language to learn about. So uh, there's actually, the restriction here is that you would have much less time than an engineer to pick a product. So an engineer can actually pick five different languages and learn about them. And if four of them actually fails, if, they, if it doesn't work out, it's OK, because the guy has a time. You know, he can actually go in. He can uh, just work on that surviving language. A designer doesn't really have that, because you know, if you actually pick a language, you learn about it, get really good at it, and if the language dies, then you're left with nothing, because you still need to be a good designer, and you don't really have another time, you know, another chunk of time to learn about anything. So um, there's actually two separate things that um, you look at when choosing your language to learn about it, and the first thing is, this is quite simple, actually. It's the uh, use of the language and the remaining lifetime. You essentially need to pick something that is created quite recently, but also has a chance of surviving uh, long into the future. That means uh, the investment that you would actually spend in the language would last and you would get you know, a quite a long time of benefit from it. The second thing is the community, and this is kind of the overlooked part. Uh, this essentially means that um, when you use a language, what you're using is actually the libraries that you're using, and you need uh, a good community to create these libraries that you want to use. So um, you essentially need to pick a language with a um, reasonable, reasonable enough community. It doesn't have to be big, but it needs to be able to good enough that if you go to Stack Overflow, there will be somebody that has an answer to the questions that you might have. So uh, to make it more practical, I do have a couple examples of uh, Oh, sorry. I do have a couple of examples of how this would actually work in practice, and I have some recommendations for you. So the first thing is that if you don't really know anything about uh, coding, what you should learn is HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, 
Plus, if you can actually you know, have the time, you should learn about AngularJS. The reason for that is pretty much anything that you actually do will be crossing the web. Even if you're just like a mobile designer, even if you work on iOS, even if you work on Android, it doesn't really matter because you will have to create a web view at some point, and that web view will have uh, the HTML in it. So you have to figure it out. The second thing, if you actually know about this, uh, I would recommend learning Node.js. This is useful and this is especially useful for designers because this is actually a language that uh, is exactly the same as JavaScript. So if you know how to use JavaScript in the browser, you also use how to use JavaScript in Node.js. That means you actually don't have to learn about a new language. You don't have to get practice learning using your new language. You can use the exact same thing that you would normally have. And uh, the good and the bad thing is that uh, JavaScript will probably last forever because everybody is using it. And I know uh, some engineers don't really like using JavaScript, but it's what we have and it's what we are stuck with. So um, if you, you know, the faster you learn about JavaScript, the better it will be for your career. And uh, the third thing is that um, this is actually the ideation process, and uh, this is where I go into middle entrepreneurship. And uh, what this means is to find uh, an idea that a designer can implement and still is useful. So the first real constraint that you have is that you have a certain mental limit. You cannot go above a certain threshold of complexity. You do have. If you, you can create a new thing, but you cannot maintain it. So what this means is that the idea should be creatable, but also maintainable by you. Maintenance is usually the heaviest burden, and if you can, you will be able to create stuff that you might not actually be able to maintain. So this is actually quite an important thing to keep in mind. And uh, there are three golden rules in this. They are pretty straightforward, as far as I understand. And uh, the first thing is, as I said, it has to be simple enough that you can design and implement and maintain. And uh, the second thing is, uh, it needs to be useful enough. And what this means is that when somebody you know, opens your application, your mobile or your desktop or web application, the guy will want to buy this. You know, if somebody needs to pay some sort of output for this. And uh, the last thing is, there has to be a valuable market. And that means, quite simply, the, uh, there has to be many enough people, you know, lots, quite a bit of people, that would be willing to buy it, so you will actually turn a profit. And uh, this is an example. Uh, this is actually quite one of the well-known examples. This is uh, one guy service. Uh, there is, uh, it just only does bookmarking. So this is not much different than you know, any browser's bookmarks tab, but uh, it just saves online. And the cost is $10 per year. And uh, the important and the kind of astonishing part is that this product didn't change for four years. The guy created this, it stopped. There are no new features, there's nothing coming, and the guy, uh, this product is, as far as the guy says, is making $200,000 in profit, not in revenue, in profit. This is, you know, if this is something that a designer can do, and I don't really see why any of you won't be able to replicate this. This is the reason of the talk, essentially. And uh, the last thing is uh, one. And this is more about planning the time and um, being the designer and the engineer at the same time does have some unique challenges in planning time, and that is what I want to talk about. So um, this is kind of the business part of it. This will get a little bit boring, but this is quite important that you do this before you start the project. And that is essentially, I know that there's quite a lot of PMs here. The first thing they will notice is that you need to calculate the return on investment. And uh, what that means is that um, for anything you do, you will actually need to turn some sort of profit. But that, that doesn't need to be cash. That can be just being known, being able to get clients, open source. If you actually have an open source project, you will get you know, quite, a lot, quite a bit of highlights and you know, news. And that might be 
and I prefer it for you. And um, the second thing you need to do afterwards, after determining what profit is for you, you need to uh, calculate the real cost of the project. And uh, this is an important thing to actually keep in mind, because when you're working on a project for such a long time, it's really easy to lose the track of time. And uh, that means you will be sinking on almost infinite amount of hours into this and uh, get basically pretty much nothing. And after this, the third thing is uh, the threshold of recouping the cost. And uh, I have a formula. This is just my personal experience. But the important thing is not, uh, not a certain location in time, but it's more about having a point in six months, let's say, into the future that you will look at the project and determine if you actually got something out of it. And uh, the next thing is uh, setting the timeline. And uh, this is normally, this is how a design agency works. This is how uh, any design company works, actually. Normally, all of these blocks would be done with different types of people. So you would have an engineer, you would have a product manager, and you would have a designer that would be dealing with separating these tasks. But if you're just a single guy, a single person that needs to deal with this, what you need to do is that you need to actually learn about separating these little things. That essentially means if you're working on the engineering side of things, if you're coding the front end of your application, you should not think about design. It essentially means that if you have a design fixed, if you, if you go to implement this, you should never change the design as much as possible. Because if you actually start to think so think of them at the same time. The danger is that um, when you have this, you might actually make the design easier to implement. And if you actually change the design to be able to do that, then uh, you're just uh, rolling backwards into mediocrity. So you need to fix the deadlines. You need to fix the deliverables. And you try to not do them at the same time and do them in, in a sequence. And uh, the last thing that I, uh, this is the end of the process, and uh, you just need to come to the point that I was talking about, the point in which you have a check, the, uh, the moment whether you got a profit or not. And this is the moment if you actually recouped your costs. That's it, congratulations. And in that case, if you stop working on this project, anything, any sort of money or profit that you get afterwards will be a plus. If you haven't actually gotten this point, what I strongly suggest is that you stop working on the project. Because the idea is to fail as fast as possible. And the ideas are cheap. You can have 50 different ideas at the same time. It doesn't really matter. You just need to find a new thing and work on it, because if you don't fail, if you don't fail fast, if you don't fail often, then you will be stuck with a project that is on life support, and you're supporting it essentially forever without actually getting any sort of return. And uh, in summary, uh, what I talk about is, is simply that uh, this is the best time to actually be a designer, because you know if you actually figure out a little bit of coding, you will have an incredible amount of leverage in, uh, in dealing with tech. And uh, at this point, coding is easy enough that a designer can figure this out on spare time. And if you get better at coding, the better, the easier it will become, because you will have more practice, and you will, it will just mostly work a lot better. And uh, the more importantly, and the thing that's advocating for, is that if you have uh, your own project that is making money, then you can be the master of your own destiny. And uh, that's pretty much it. Um, thank you. And if you have any questions, I would be happy to ask. Well, I have 30 seconds, but yes. <laughs> any questions? Uh, in that case, that's it. Thank you.